Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Alessa Hromychuk, and I'm the director of the Ukrainian Institute London. We are an independent charity, and we champion Ukrainian culture and shape the conversation about Ukraine in the UK and beyond. We run a diverse program of public-facing events, educational courses in Ukrainian language, literature, culture, and produce digital content in order to enable our audiences around the world to access nuanced and reliable information about Ukraine. So if you haven't explored our organization yet, please visit our website and follow us on social media uh, platforms. We are truly thrilled to have Dame Melinda Simmons with us tonight and hear about her ambassador an ambassadorship in Ukraine at such a difficult time for the country and its people. And we are very, very grateful to JW3 for hosting this discussion. And I would also like to thank Ukrainian Jewish Encounter for supporting this event. Just to let you know, we'll be taking photos throughout the event and we are recording the discussion too and it'll be uploaded on our YouTube channel. So if you don't want to appear in any of the footage or the photographs, please let one of us know after the event. The event is being moderated by Dr. Oyan Blacker, Associate Professor in Ukrainian and East European Culture at University College London, School of Slavonic and East European Studies. Oyan has specialized in literature and culture of East Central Europe. His main focus is Ukraine, but he has also worked on Poland and Russia. Oyam's recent research has focused on cultural memory in cities in East Central Europe that experienced large-scale population shifts after the Second World War. In his book, Memory, the City and the Legacy of World War II in East Central Europe, published by Routledge in 2019, he looks at cities such as Wrocław, Lviv and Kaliningrad, which were transferred between states after the war, and examines cities that lost large Jewish communities such as Warsaw and Kyiv. I will now invite Oyam to introduce our guest, Dave Melinda Simmons. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Olesia. Um, it's a real pleasure, a real honor for me to be able to introduce tonight's uh, guest, tonight's speaker to you, Dame Melinda Simmons, uh, who was appointed uh, UK ambassador to Ukraine in 2019. And she went through some pretty stiff challenges during her time as ambassador, not only going through the outbreak of the coronavirus, um, three changes in UK Prime Minister, and of course, the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine in uh, February last year. And during that time, Dame Melinda showed extraordinary leadership. I think anyone who followed her on Twitter, followed what she's been doing in the media, would have seen that very clearly. Uh, the British Embassy was one of the last to leave Kiev and left for only a very short time and one of the first to come back and start working again. Uh, and Dame Melinda was exceptionally active during that time, supporting volunteer efforts, meeting with soldiers, visiting reconstruction efforts, and obviously leading the UK's response on the ground uh, in Kiev. Uh, and she's also, during, that time, during her time as ambassador, worked actively with the Jewish community in Ukraine, um, including attending the re-established uh, services at the synagogue in Kiev after they were temporarily paused uh, during the first uh, weeks and months of the invasion. Um, and for her services to diplomacy earlier this year, Dame Melinda received uh, a Damehood. And uh, that is possibly the highest honor she's received, although she also had a croissant named after her in, by a Kiev bakery, which is probably... <laughs> <laughs> Definitely higher. Somewhere on the same, on the same level. <laughs> um, so I'm really, really thrilled and delighted to be able to speak to you, to be able to speak to someone who's been in Ukraine during this time, but also been obviously representing my country in Ukraine as well, and doing so extremely effectively. Um, so there, there are lots and lots of things that I want to, to talk about, but I want to just begin maybe by your, how you came to Ukraine. Um, you came there in 2019 after spending, I think, about a year preparing and, and learning the language. Um, but it wasn't 
you weren't new to Ukraine. You, you knew you, you've worked in various different parts of the world, in various parts of the world with complicated um, situations of war and conflict, um, and you had some experience of working at, in relation to Ukraine before as well. So when you coming into that job in that year that you were preparing, what were your what was your image of Ukraine? What were you expecting? And then were those, were those expectations met or, or what was there something in particular that surprised you? Thank you. And uh, thanks for, for having me tonight. Um, I, uh, so first of all, it was eight months that I had to learn the language. I mean, goodness. It can be a challenge to work at the Foreign Office, but being told to learn a language that you had no knowledge of before and be fluent in it, fluent enough to be able to present your credentials in comfortable Ukrainian and have a conversation with the president in your first week there, that, that was a challenge the likes of which I hadn't had before. So that was seven days a week cramming to uh, get myself to that level. And I don't remember it at a particularly happy time, I have to tell you, it was, it was quite stressful. But what was really interesting was that when I wasn't studying the language, I was talking to people as much as I could and reading every possible recommended book on Ukraine and adding to um, my own background. My background was in conflict and fragile states, and I'd worked in and on many of them. So I came with quite a good understanding of that and its impact on development. But in the previous four years, um, I'd been working most particularly on Ukraine because I had set up this cross-government fund, the Conflict Stability and Security Fund, and Ukraine was one of the biggest recipients of it. Um, and because it was one of the biggest, I visited it um, so that I could see what we were doing with the money and also just get a sense, really, of the role it was playing alongside the politics. So I was already deeply interested in it. And when I came to think about what happened was first, I thought it might be fun to do an ambassador job. Felt like a whole different set of challenges. And then I thought, well, if you're going to do that, where might it be? And Ukraine just immediately presented itself as a brilliant place to go and do that. It brought together all my background understanding with personal history. And, um, and to be honest, by the end of the eight months before I came, I was not one of those who characterized Ukraine as a poor and corrupt country, which is what you keep hearing. Mm -hmm. I understood why people saw Ukraine as a poor and corrupt country. No one else was killing themselves over eight months to try to get to know it. I was um, incredibly excited uh, about going. There was, the, there was the war, of course, and I am among those who think this invasion started in 2014 with the incursion to the east of the country in Crimea. So there was that to think about and what wasn't working, because it was already clear that the Minsk agreement was not working the way it should. But there was also a country stuffed full of educated, interested, massively IT literate young people who, uh, who appeared to have a really strong commitment to grow their country into something that could be more than it had been, more than it could. And um, of course, during my time there, President Zelensky was elected, so that added uh, either to the sense of excitement or despair, because when I arrived in Ukraine, you were either one or the other. You were either really excited that someone completely new had come to finally tackle the woes of the country, or you were, you were desperate because you thought you needed a safe, experienced pair of hands in Poroshenko, who'd been president before then. So coming into that environment and starting work at actually exactly the same time as President Zelensky was mm -hmm. appointing his cabinet, that's a real privilege. Um, to start the same time as a president who had zero political experience. I had zero ambassador experience. I thought we had something in common. <laughs> um, I mean, what was your impression of Zelensky? Because he's a very interesting and quite complicated figure in the way that he came into politics. Mm. And, you know, when, when you took up your position, he was, um, as you said, just coming into power, but, you know, by the time of the full-scale in invasion, his popularity had really plummeted. It had, yeah. Um, so I wonder, you know, and you've obviously met him and you know him, what, what, are, what are your impressions of him as a politician and as a leader? So um, I, I have, I've met him um, several times. And um, I first met him when I handed my credentials. And actually, I was only in the second group of ambassadors to deliver credentials to the president. And I got the very clear sense when I was doing it that he had no idea what the point of this ceremony was. <laughs> well, to be fair, I didn't really have much idea of that either. And it is a really bizarre ceremony. You know, there's a guard of honor and a red carpet. And I was one of five ambassadors presenting credentials. And horrifically, I was fifth. And each one takes an hour. So that's five hours I had to get nervous 
to, to wait. I was literally waiting for five hours in the uh, grounds of an incredible building that you were then escorted up by a solemn procession of uh, soldiers bearing arms. And um, by the time I got to the top to bow to the Ukrainian flag, I had literally lost my voice. I, had, I, was, I was so gripped by stage fright because it was such an extraordinary thing. But then I saw the president, who, who is not a tall man, and uh, I saw that he actually looked as nervous as I felt. So I thought, this, okay, this is good, we're cool, it's all right. He has no idea what's supposed to be happening either. And so in the room that was full of people, full of um, people who were filming the event, and uh, diplomats, senior diplomats were there, and cabinet ministers, I delivered my speech in Ukrainian, and then I handed over, you're supposed to hand over your credentials, which, by the way, I hand-scribed with a quill. I, I did that over. Uh, with all its archaic, beautiful, it's a beautiful document, gave that to him, and then you go and have a bilateral with him in the corner. Um, and uh, he had his, the first impression I had of him was that he uh, didn't want to be reading quill-written stuff. What he wanted was to talk immediately uh, about trade deals and visas and access to the West in a bilateral partnership. And uh, I think that characterized every conversation I had with him or that any minister that was visiting had with him before the war and during war. Zelensky wanted to get things done. And he may not always have you know, gone about them the right way, but he definitely wanted things for his country. During the war, of course, it became a different set of things we were talking about. But still, there was a very direct um, way in which we were able to talk about them. I honestly do believe the fact that he didn't have a diplomat or a politician's background, and neither did I, actually enabled a very... Um, a direct conversation of the kind that traditional diplomats don't normally do. And I do think that helped. I mean, yeah, it's, it's interesting that you say that because I think watching the way you met the challenge of being the ambassador at, in wartime, in some ways it did remind me actually of the way that he met the challenge as, as president and as someone maybe who comes in and doesn't have the sort of sense of... the. The, the same old ways of doing things, the same kind of limitations, maybe comes fresh to it, maybe comes with a new approach. You know, he's a, he's an excellent communicator. It's one of his big strengths as a, as yeah. a president. Um, and I think you're the same, you know, in, in the way that you communicate with people via social media, for example, is, is very, very important, actually, I think, you know, in, in, in allowing people to see the UK's support for Ukraine and what the UK is doing on, on the ground. Well, thank you for that. Um, so on his side, it's absolutely the case that the way in which he communicated with people was his, his big thing. I used to, before the war, um, occasionally would travel with him, which is a real privilege. And uh, I remember one particular case where we went to Milove, which is not far from the Russian... In fact, actually, it's like a kilometre from the Russian border. It's occupied now. It's part of uh, occupied Donbass. So you can't go there. So I'm very lucky to have gone there. But I went there with him. And uh, we went there for a ceremony, a remembrance ceremony. And I could see a large crowd gathering at the edge. And it was the entire village. The entire village had gathered to see if they could get a selfie with the president. They were so excited to see him. And then we all stayed while he, he talked to pretty much every single person. He talked to the kids. He talked to the grown-ups. He talked to the grandparents. He was extraordinary in the open way in which he would do this. So it doesn't surprise me at all when I see him going to the front line, as we all know that he does, which is also an incredibly dangerous thing for him to do. But he goes and does it, that um, uh, soldiers gather around him. Actually, one of the most powerful pieces of footage I saw of President Zelensky this year was he stopped off at a roadside station on the way to one of his front line visits. Or some, it definitely looked like a roadside garage. Obviously, it wasn't named for security reasons, but the footage was released. And there were soldiers queuing to buy a cup of coffee. And he joined this queue. The president was in the queue. So, of course, my first thought was, what is people thinking not getting him a flipping cup of coffee? You shouldn't have to queue for it. And then, of course, my second thought was, the president's lining up with all these soldiers waiting to buy a, a, a cappuccino like the rest of them. And the like the rest of them is what um, makes him so relatable. Mm. In that sense, he's an extraordinary wartime president. So... Um, He's kind of the man for the moment in that sense. As for me, it's true that my social media doesn't, is, is unusual. It's not totally out there, but it is unusual for ambassadors to um, talk in that 
to be that communicative, if you like, that, that sort of naturally communicative, communicative. There's an awful lot of awkward standing in front of flags that says, delighted to meet the representative of so-and-so. That's usually how ambassadors use social media. Most are a little nervous of putting themselves out there. Even before the war, I was doing quite a lot of it, but actually during the invasion, it became clear to me, just by talking to my own family, that if I didn't use social media to explain what was going on, it was impossible for most people to understand it. So using social media, even as... And Ukrainians would often tell me that at 3 o'clock in the morning, they'd look at my Twitter account to check that I was in shelter, because they were in shelter and feeling really bad about it. But if they went on Twitter, they could see me saying, I'm in shelter. It's all hell's broken loose outside, and it would, com it would be a comfort to them. So there were two audiences going on there, people who could feel UK support in a visceral way because I was experiencing what they were experiencing, and UK people who were uh, gaining some understanding through the same lived experience, and that's why mm. I did it. Every so often, I would get foreign office people going, are you sure that's a little bit out there, isn't it? But no one actually ever said, don't do this. I think very quickly it became clear that Russia was waging a war on social media against Ukraine, just as they're waging a war with food, and they're waging a war with Ukraine's children, and they're waging a war on the economy. They're not just waging a war militarily. Well, so the UK is giving a whole lot of military help. We're giving humanitarian help. We're campaigning on grain, and we've given a huge amount of fiscal support to help with the economy. Seems fairly obvious to me that we would also bring that uh, support of Ukraine to social media. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think also one of the things that I certainly appreciate is um, reading your statements, and I think Ukrainians also appreciate it, is that you call things by their name. You know, you don't sort of tiptoe around um, speaking about the brutality of what's happening, about you know, the atrocities, about the fact that torture and rape and kidnapping are, are happening, um, and that you're not sort of reticent about speaking about it in, a, in an emotional way. You know, and it's one of the, one of the things that I think is really, when we talk about a war, it's very difficult to know how to speak about it and find the language to talk about war. Um, and there's a lot of euphemism, and there's a lot of kind of, Especially in, in the media, there's a lot of, well, this side and that side. But I think it's important to name things and important to, say, to speak honestly and not to you know, look for some kind of false sense of balance when that's inappropriate. Mm. And, you know, and that's what I feel when I, when I see the way that you communicate. Yes. I mean, for all ambassadors, they have that perspective that, of course, British ministers don't. Ambassadors, their job is to get under the skin of the country mm. and therefore know things and be able to say things about the country. That's kind of the point of having an embassy in the country at all, is to get under the skin of it. Um, but um, I was also travelling and meeting people who had uh, experienced the most unimaginable things. And if they were content to talk about those things then I had a duty to reflect those things. It's not that it all seemed crystal clear inside Ukraine. There are perspectives, but actually on the issue of Ukrainians being targeted, there was no perspective. There just what it, there was what it was. And it needed to be put out there, I thought, as part of this you know, countering fake information, but also because there is so much nuance and so much jargon around describing war that actually it can very easily just get kind of lost among um, both the hysteria and the fake information. Um, I suppose if I learn one thing, it's that you can cut through quite a lot of that if you can speak authentically mm -hmm. uh, about what you see and hear. I went to Butcher, and I saw those mass graves and talked to relatives of people who had been shot just cycling down the street or whole families, you know, found with their hands tied behind their backs. I have a heritage that dictates that you don't go through that experience and not talk about it. I was not going to leave being someone who had not brought world attention. What, what the government I represented chose to do, I could lobby them on, but that wasn't my job. I didn't have that responsibility. The prime minister and ministers had that responsibility. But I had the responsibility to tell them like it was and make clear to, to people generally what was going on. Then everyone else could judge for themselves what it was they were reading, but I wasn't going to be someone who was going to leave without telling it. Absolutely. I mean, and this, this being in that situation, I imagine, was not something that you had anticipated going into this job? But I had anticipated it, actually. You had? Not just not in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't think it was going to happen within those four years. But if you read all those books and you really tried to understand, frankly, if you went back before 2014, as I had been in my previous job, mm -hmm. 
I knew about Georgia, and you know, I knew about Moldova, and Crimea had happened, and it was really clear, two things were really clear. One was that uh, Russia invaded these areas in order to create points of instability that you could then use, manipulate, put the temperature up or down as you wanted when, when the time was right, but uh, that also Putin had a special issue with Ukraine, as frankly every leader had before him. So it's pretty clear to me that having annexed a pretty considerable piece of territory, intent was there. He hadn't just annexed it so he could sit on it. And Crimea, frankly, everyone could see was being increasingly militarized. And Crimean Tatars were already saying before I'd arrived there that political persecution had reached, you know, pretty high levels. Mm -hmm. They're now off the charts. We're pretty high then. Very clear to me intent was there. I just didn't think it was going to happen when I was there. Mm -hmm. Has that experience of, of going through the last sort of uh, 18 months or so and also being in the middle of that situation that Russia has created around its borders of instability um, and sort of leading the, UK, the, UK, the UK's presence in Ukraine, has that changed how you think about the role of diplomacy and, the, and also the role of the UK in the world? You know, because this is something that we're thinking a lot about post-Brexit, of course, what's the UK's role in the world, and a lot is spoken about it, but I think, you know, to me, anyway, what I've seen over the last, since the full-scale invasion, is that is the UK is playing a leading role, and it is doing, it is acting, you know, when, when others are speaking and prevaricating and waiting and um, humming and eyeing, that the UK has been acting, and it's been, it's been refreshing to see. Um, but I wonder what about your perspective on how the UK is, the UK's position in the world now, and also how our diplomacy um, functions in that context. Um, so, of course, I, I was in uh, Ukraine when we finally left the EU and attended my first and my last EU meeting, and I also was heading the team in Kiev that negotiated the bilateral trade deal. It was one of the first trade deals to be signed, actually, and it was a brilliant moment of being able to do it. But of course, I was equally conscious that Ukraine wanted to join the EU. And so I was, I was surfing a very delicate line of, look, we left for our reasons. You want to join for your reasons. These things don't necessarily meet. We support you wanting to join the EU. But you were still acutely conscious of sort of coming from a, a sort of what, a, a position that most East European countries just did not understand why we had chosen to leave an organization that pretty much all of them were so desperate to join. So, you know, you kind of camped on that. But um, I've been doing debrief calls all last week and this week before I finally go on leave <clears throat> and rest, which I really need to do. And uh, a couple of days ago in Eastern Europe, Directorate, I was doing a meeting like this for their staff and they asked, what's the one uh, message you want to leave us with? <clears throat> and I said, look what we did because uh, I think it has been extraordinary for clarity of policy and for the way in which whole of government came together and then whole of people came together to um, support the cause and then engage directly with people. I, uh, I'm really proud of the piece that I played in it, but I also think it will have repercussions that are nothing but positive for the way in which people who work elsewhere in the world and have to deal with other challenges, some of which have occurred during this time, but of course there will be more know what's possible. I believe that our experience in Ukraine has a built, built a new confidence, actually, for our own diplomatic effort. And that's an incredible thing to be proud of, not just that you've helped deliver in Ukraine, but that you've been part of an effort that then potentially transforms the way in which we do things in the future. Mm, absolutely. Um, I want to come back to something that you said a couple of minutes ago. Um, you mentioned about visiting Bucha, and you mentioned, and you connected it to your own family history. Um, and obviously you have um, family links with Ukraine. Um, part of your, your, your family comes from Ukraine and uh, part from Poland, as far as I understand. Um, and so with that, you come to Ukraine with a certain prehistory. Um, and the history of Jews in Ukraine is obviously, it's a complicated subject. Uh, it's a difficult subject. It's a difficult subject to talk about in Ukraine today. Um, it has been for a long time, for obvious reasons. Um, Ukraine, obviously, a place where Jews lived for hundreds of years, you know, up to a thousand years, depending on how you count. 
um, mostly in peace, but obviously with some extremely um, violent interruptions to that existence. Um, and I wonder how, I want to ask you first of all, how that informed your attitude towards Ukraine coming into it. Um, you know, your expectations of what Ukraine would be like on that, on that, on that level. Um, but also what your experience has been uh, working with the Jewish community in Ukraine of the attitudes towards Jews in Ukraine and also the attitudes towards the, the history in Ukraine. You know, the, the rich heritage on the one hand, but also the story of the pogroms, the Holocaust on the other hand as well. So that's a really big question and it's really difficult to answer it concisely, but, you know, I'll try. Um, so first of all, that's, that was the one blank slate for me in all the learning I'd done and all the outreach that I'd done. Picked up very little about Jewish history in Ukraine. So it's maybe easiest if I reflect a few moments that sort of were pivotal for me because I very deliberately went out of my way to try to understand it. The one thing I told, first thing I told my embassy staff on arrival was that whenever I travelled, and ambassadors do a lot of travel, and Ukraine's a huge country, but that whenever I travelled, I told them I wanted to visit the synagogue if there was one, and I wanted to visit the killing field. Every place in Ukraine has a killing field. Most of them are still not um, memorialised. But I thought it would be powerful if I went. And there was a picture taken that I'd been to this site. And a um, bit of a surprise for embassy staff, but they, you know, they did their research, and most times they found the, uh, a killing field, and they found the synagogue, and so I did that. And in so doing, built a picture for myself, really, a really tragic picture, because in pretty much every case, the number of people, the number of Jews killed during the Holocaust particularly had equated to a minimum of 30% of that place. Most times it was 40 or 50%. So I, I find those numbers staggering, shocking, really. And I would spend time in some of those places. Some of them were towns, busy towns, like I remember Vinitsia, a picture of the day after Jews were marched down to the local park, which was only about a 20-minute walk away, and all shot, was that one, one day it was a bustling market, and the next day it was just empty. Just empty, and then everyone else was getting on with their lives. And this was a, a, a picture, actually, throughout the country that I just felt the need to try to get into. Um, and uh, I did that partly by tracing a little bit what had happened to my own family, so I found my family name on a Holocaust memorial in Kharkiv, half an hour outside Kharkiv, at a place called Drobitsky Yar, where about 14,000 Jews of Kharkiv were shot in 1941. That memorial was hit by a Russian missile, actually, um, last November, I think. And I remember never being so angry in my entire life as I was when that happened, which is odd, isn't it? Because I'd been to Butcher, I'd been to Bravaria, I'd been to Irpin, I'd seen these sites of mass killings, and yet the thing that really made me most angry was that the one place where I'd found a bit of history from my family now didn't exist anymore. Um, so it was an ex interesting emotional reaction. But the other thing, probably most interesting for me, was that I would often do interviews, as ambassadors do, I would do interviews, and uh, everybody was really excited about the fact that I had Ukrainian heritage. So they would say, it's fantastic that your family is from Ukraine, tell us a bit about your family. And I would say, okay, well, they lived outside Kharkiv, and my own family, this is the story of, of why they left. They left because of anti-Semitism, Half of them ended up in the UK. That's where my branch comes from. And they would say, great, and what happened to the rest? And I would say, well, they were all murdered in the Holocaust. And then the interview would go, so tell me about the trade deal. <laughs> uh, I found that really, uh, really interesting. So for the first three or four interviews, I would go, all right, let's talk about the trade deal. And I would tell them about it. But um, as I uncovered more, of course, what, what I was encountering was um, a combination of a deep discomfort to uh, peel off that plaster and really talk about what circumstances led to those Jews being killed, because, of course, it dovetails both with Ukrainian history, it's part of Ukrainian history, but it also involves actual Ukrainians. And that's an untold story, as yet untold. Uh, and it's a very delicate and sensitive thing to do. But I tried to do it. Interview after interview, I would go half a step further, half a step, half a step to try to help people understand that we could talk about this uncomfortable thing, 
I was not going to act angry, I was not going to get militant, but we really needed to talk about the full circumstances in which my family were marched to that ravine and shot. And uh, I managed partially to do that, if you like. It took a really long time, probably not until the beginning of last year, maybe, that we were able to have that kind of conversation. But the other thing, of course, is that Zelensky is Jewish, and the other part of this is that uh, Ukrainians, after 70 years of Soviet occupation, are, are anti-Semitism blind. They're not, not anti-Semitic. They just, quite a lot of them, don't know anti-Semitism when they see it. And so I would come across things that would be shocking in this country that were very normal in Ukraine and about which people would get quite defensive when I would say, that is anti-Semitic, that thing that you've said. So one of the most egregious things is that you can freely buy, still, in Kiev, the little Russian dolls, you know, the ones where you open them up and there's a little one inside, etc. You can get those that have um, pictures of rabbis on them with curls and hook nose holding money bags. You can buy those in most tourist shops in Kiev. And in one particular one, I saw them for sale next to a Hitler Russian doll. I walked into that one, actually, and said, why, why are you selling these? In fact, what I said was, why are you selling them next to each other? But obviously, there are so much bigger questions than that. But I asked. She said, well, they're just funny. They're a joke. And uh, she, was, she was quite uh, annoyed that I was asking her about it. But people would buy them. And who would buy them? Ukrainians would buy them. They would call them their lucky Jew. Some people, and you would take them to job interviews. Why? Because if you took your lucky Jew with you, you'd get a well-paid job. So you see the extent of this, and I would say, okay, that's a completely, that, uh, everything from beginning to end of that is an anti-Semitic trope. And they would go, no, everyone knows that Jews are good with money and therefore, you know, the symbolism. And then I would hark back to the Holocaust and say, this is what happens when an anti-Semitic trope becomes a bad thing. And they would not make that connection. The answer, I'm afraid, I, I, uh, leaving Ukraine is, I think, not to have this binary discussion. There has to be education. It might be boring, but this needs to start in schools. And the one thing I did manage to achieve was I lobbied the Foreign Office to run anti-Semitism training that was East European specific. Because, of course, this isn't just a Ukrainian phenomenon. You can buy these uh, Russian dolls in Warsaw, by the way, in the same tourist shops. You go to the old city, you can find them there. And uh, I also found them in Vilnius. And I went to Estonia, and I found them in Tallinn, in the old market. So this is a, a, post, a former Soviet Union, post-occupation, historical gap. And the only way is to keep talking about it such that the issue has to become an integral part of their understanding of their past. And unfortunately, with the Russian invasion, I think it's made it a bit harder. Mm. But it means we all just have to keep talking about it. Well, this is, this is my next question, and that is because obviously one of the, the tropes in Russian propaganda from the very beginning, and it's still quite popular in, in Russian media is about Ukrainian Nazis and that, you know, recently people probably saw that Putin claimed that the West had deliberately placed yep. an, eth an ethnic Jew, as he put it, in, as on the head of Ukraine in order to cover up something, what he called the anti-human nature of the Kiev regime. And all of, the, you know, all of these kind of things, which is in itself, you know, a very anti-Semitic idea in itself, that, you know, the, the Jews are part of this vast conspiracy and so on and so on. Um, but because he's making those ac accusations against Ukrainians and, you know, highlighting and exaggerating, you know, the right wing and and these kind of things, that makes it sort of doubly hard for Ukrainians to talk about that and to, to for example, admit things and to be open and to be honest, because if you do that and you know, I know academics in Ukraine and who work on Ukraine who want to talk about things like the Lviv pogrom or anti-Semitism. And it becomes very difficult because you are seen as then being complicit in the propaganda. And you can see why people think that, you know, because it is being used as a, as a tool of war. Um, and it makes it extremely complicated and difficult. Um, I don't suppose you have an answer to that, but I wonder what, what you think what is the strategy in that situation? What do we do? I mean, I don't think it's complicated, but I do think it's difficult. I think it's very clear. You know, Jewish history is Ukrainian history, and Ukrainian history is Jewish history. There's no separating this out, and it may be a burden that they have. But um, I remember an actual conversation that I had with... with uh, I was with six or seven other ambassadors in a lunch with the president and his colleagues pre-war, 
in which I raised it. I raised it in the context of Babinyar, which I think has gone through a transformation, actually, in terms of its memorialising. And I was complimenting him on some of the work that had gone into that. It's also controversial, but nothing in Ukraine is not controversial. But the, the, uh, the ways in which Babinyar was now being more specifically memorialised had, had only started under the Zelensky regime. So I, I, I uh, complimented him and then asked him what he would do uh, about this lingering um, anti-Semitic rhetoric and the way and anti-Semitic blindness. And uh, he uh, brushed it off and said that there were bigger things. And then his colleagues chimed in and said, you know, if you speak about this, then Russians will perpetuate this Nazi narrative. And what I said to the president was, you want Ukraine to be a strong democracy. A strong democracy has to take painful journeys and has to accept all of its past, not just part of its past. And Ukraine wants to talk about its nationalist past and its nationalist uh, history, which is incredibly painful, as painful. Ukrainian nationalists were sent to Sachsenhausen. In fact, extraordinarily, one or two of them came out more anti-Semitic after they'd been in Sachsenhausen. And that, too, is a piece of history that has been buried, even though it's quite well do documented. It doesn't sit with the Ukrainian psyche, who see people like Bandera as total heroes. Don't want to know that Kmelnitsky was the, you know, the, the originator of, of the pogrom, etc. Don't want to know that. So, uh, so I said, if you want to be... The, the strong, West-leaning, EU, NATO country, then it, you've got to take it all on. You can't just take part of it on. And uh, I think they know that, actually. But, uh, and I still think it's important, and I still think it's the inconvenient conversation, even though, and I say this with real pain in my heart, because uh, in the context of this invasion, I've, I've lost people myself who I would call friends who have either died fighting at the front or they have died in, because their missiles hit their homes or they've died in tragic war-related accidents. But I've lost some people and I haven't even begun to internalise what that's meant for me. He knows of thousands. They have the burden of thousands of deaths every day. It's very hard to say to them, you have this existential fight and you really need to be talking about anti-Semitism. But they do, and they do because Putin's got no problem talking about it only he talks his version of it. And it's the same as every other story of the war, right? If you're not authentically talking about what's really going on, then yeah, Putin will own the narrative about what anti-Semitism is in his applied view in Ukraine. And Ukraine deserves better than that. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I think this idea of owning, owning the past and owning the narrative and not allowing it to be taken up by, by somebody else is, mm -hmm. is really important. And that, and that means talking about it. Um, I'm aware of our time sort of running away from us, so I'll ask you one question before we go to the audience, um, which is, I'm not going to ask you to predict what's going to happen. No, don't do that. Those are, that that's, that's a horrible <laughs> question, but maybe I'll ask you what, you, what do you hope for Ukraine in the future, in the near future? Maybe, it's, maybe the answer to that is obvious, but you know, I'd, I'd like to, to hear what, you, what are your hopes for Ukraine? So uh, obviously I hope they'll win. But, but I will put myself out there and say that I think they will win. I just can't say when, and I can't say how many more people will have to sacrifice their lives for it, or how many more Ukrainians will be targeted in the worst possible way. I still think it has some way to run, I'm sorry to say. But uh, I believe they'll win. And when they do win, what I hope for them is that this invasion, which no Ukrainian ever wanted and has been imposed on them, is existential nonetheless brings other things with it. We already know that some of it has. Polling in Ukraine is incredible. That there are, independent polling is really a thing in Ukraine, and it's a really, really useful marker. And uh, a recent poll showed that the appetite for corruption had plummeted. So before the war, everybody just assumed that corruption was such a societal thing that basically you just live with it. So if you poll people about corruption, pretty much only about sort of 40% would think something had to be done about it. They were just used to paying their doctor for a referral to a hospital or, you know, paying for someone for a driving test. I had to pay someone to go to a swimming pool for a certificate say I was healthy, for example. No part of society wasn't touched in some way by petty corruption. So, you know, the journey to, to transform is a big one. But what that poll showed was that the break with Russia that had, if you like, it, firstly, that felt final. But everything that was associated with it, the thug state, the the patronage, everything associated with that, Ukrainians didn't want to be a part of in their country. So this wasn't just about what happened in Russia. This was about what they thought Russia had brought into the occupation that they wanted to be rid of. Not just Russians physically, 
but of people who have manipulated the system for their own end. And Zelensky um, is very sensitive to what people think. Um, for obvious reasons, of course, at some point he's got to find another election, and it's become, I think, clear that he wants to do that. So in order to do that, he's got to be responsive to that. And in the last few months, there have been some genuinely interesting moves to do something about that and to strengthen institutions. It would be great if Ukraine emerged from this with a clear vision for how they get to that place, because I really believe with such extraordinarily motivated people, they could be an extraordinary country in terms of what they offer, not just what they become for themselves. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's a, that's a vision that I certainly share, and I think probably all, all the Ukrainians in the room would share it as well. Um, I'm sure that there will be many questions. I could, I could, I could keep asking you <laughs> question after question, but I'm sure that our audience has questions. Um, I believe we have a roving microphone to deal with uh, to take your questions, um, and I'll do my best to see who's got their hand up and get to everybody. There are so, lots. There are so many questions. <laughs> there are lots. Um, I think. Who did I see first? I think I saw the, this gentleman here was one of the first I saw, for sure. Yeah, the gentleman in the blue shirt. Uh, Stephen Dio, lifelong Russia watcher. Ambassador, um, first of all, thank you very much for fascinating discussion tonight. Um, I preferred your, um, maybe it's because I'm not, not young enough to use Twitter too much, but um, your LinkedIn contributions were fabulous. Thank over you. the last few years, and thank you so much for that. It really, everything you said, I mean, it, you, you, you didn't come across as an ambassador, you came across as someone who understands the country and cares about it and wants more people to know, so that you were, it, it worked. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you have, of course, by moving on and leaving Ukraine, you've left very large shoes to fill. Um, I'm not asking you to be personal about your successor, but what more can... Britain do we, we've um, I have very close connections in Ukraine too and in fact I've just been talking to some this weekend um, and they are very grateful to what Britain has, has, has been doing um, but it seems to me it's very important that we keep it in people's awareness that this ter terrible war is going on and what more can Britain do then to to follow your fantastic example but also make sure that the British people know that this terrible war is going on and, and what is happening. Thank you. Well, I mean, part of it you've answered yourself, actually, which is that we have to keep reminding people that it's going on. And precisely because I, I believe it will go on for some time longer, we're going to have to just keep up that level of effort in communicating on it. But also, we're going to have to stick with all the parts of how this war is being fought. So I think most Brits would, would completely understand um, and in fact, in our own polling, it's over 70% of Britons think that the government has the right policy on Ukraine, which is also unprecedented. You never normally get that kind of number. So that's a real, that's, both, that's a message to Rishi Sunak too, of what he needs to do for his people. And so everybody understands the military need because everybody understands in some vague way that that fighting is going on. Um, there's, a, there's a thing that needs to, that I think still hasn't really landed and particularly with our media, that to state the obvious, the amount of uh, occupied territory is massive, and that the counteroffensive was never going to be able to restore that territory in, you know, in this year. It, it just was never going to happen. But the progress is, is difficult, and it's slow, but it is progress. And therefore, just geographically, we have to stick with it for a long time. But also, it's a hybrid war, and that's the bit that I think is less clear. That if you put down a load of humanitarian aid, that's it, that's done. Or you give a tranche to the World Bank so that you can see uh, Ukraine's economy through on life support for a quarter, you don't need to do it again. But we do. And I think the difficult, the dilemma for this government, or indeed whichever government after the next election, whether it's Conservative or with Labour win or whatever, are going to have to eyeball the need to be present uh, in all parts of it. And why do we need to be present in all of them? Well, firstly, because the other thing that we've managed to exhibit is our ability to influence others by stepping into the game. So there's an interesting thing where, um, for example, this is, this is out there as a public thing. We don't have F-16 planes, but other countries do. The Ukrainians wanted F-16s, asked us for them. We said, no, we don't have them, but uh, we'll talk to other countries who have them. And in the meantime, what we will do is we'll give your pilots generic 
training so that they're ready for their specialist level, they don't have to wait for it. And then uh, the Prime Minister created a training coalition. So we are really good, not just at giving our own stuff, but also saying we'll get in there uh, enough for people to see, ooh, the Brits are in, we, we should be in. We're very good at coalition building that way. We're going to need to continue that. We're going to have to keep, to keep doing that on grain, um, not least for its global impact. And we're going to have to do that on uh, prosecution for war crimes. I'll come back to that in a second. And we're going to have to come back uh, and keep doing that on the economy just as much as we must do it on the military. But back to the prosecution on war crimes, that's probably one of the most important parts of it because the range of crimes and the number of people against whom things have been done is now, in my opinion, so huge that, and here's the biggest challenge of all, every country that has supported Ukraine, not just the UK, is going to have to eyeball the really difficult policy challenge of what happens after Ukraine wins. And lots of countries are going to want to come back to rebuilding an economic relationship with one of the largest countries in the world. I don't believe that can be done. Justice is going to have to happen. I really believe we need to look at how we liquidate sanctioned assets and get them towards Ukraine's reconstruction. And a whole load of legal uh, issues stand in the way, but after all, laws are made by people. We should look at how we achieve that. And then we think about the type of Russia that we want to do business with. That's an unenviable list of things, but we're going to have to do it all because this won't just be about winning the war. It's also got to be about winning the peace. How do you stop this from happening again? You're going to have to invest in all these areas. That's my pitch. Okay, I think I'll stay in this corner and then I'll come to the back. The lady here in the black shirt, I think you were, had your hand up. Thank you. Uh, I mean, quite a few very complicated topics were covered today, but my question will be sort of, um, what will you miss here in London, like being residing, like being resident of Ukraine for four years? What will you miss the most in London here? Ukraine? What have I missed about being in London? No, 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 no. What will you miss of Ukraine, of Ukraine or, or Kiev, right. like yeah. here in London? Yeah. That it's really hard to know where to start. It really is, because the truth is that I completely fell in love with the place. So you know that um, the ambassador posting to Ukraine is a three plus one, which means that you do three years and an optional fourth. I'd been there three weeks when I asked for my fourth year. <laughs> it was immediately clear this was going to be fabulous for all the interest and, and, and the debate and the, the, the controversy, but also because of the sheer beauty. If you have not been to Kiev after the war, you need to go because it's stunningly beautiful. And very few people know that. So you should go there before everybody finds out. But it's a, it's a really extraordinarily beautiful place steeped in history. So, of course, uh, I miss that. I miss the, 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 the particular beauty. But what I also will love... So I, uh, I'm also unusual in that I didn't go and shop for my food where ambassadors went and shopped for their food. So I didn't go to the sort of massive, posh hypermarket places that sold, you know, Western fish and cheese. I used to go to a market that was about a 20-minute drive the other way, over the bridge, where all these babusias would turn up at the market with all their locally grown... And, and they were frightening to do business with. But uh, that is what I, I used to love about them. And one of the great things that I learned was how to have that conversation. I can tell you, by the way, about 15 different types of tomato, <laughs> all grown in Ukraine which is one of the best things I learned. And this is the thing that I'll miss, actually, is because Ukraine is such an agrarian country and everybody grows stuff, that uh, you come away, if you shop in that way and you don't shop in the polystyrene-wrapped, you know, stuff from wherever else, um, you, uh, you learn more about the country having those sorts of conversations. But I will say, they're not all nice about it. <laughs> <laughs> they really aren't. And I think, um, actually, very early on, when I just arrived in the country and I was trying to buy a tube ticket from, uh, from a, a kind of older lady who was serving at the ticket office. She answered me in Russian. So back then before the war, you would hear Russian as often as you hear Ukrainian in Kiev. I didn't speak Russian, I spoke Ukrainian, and it was quite shaky after only eight months. So I said to her in Ukrainian, I'm terribly sorry, I don't speak Russian. Can you, answer, can you tell me again in Ukrainian? And she said something else in Russian. So I turned to the guy behind me in the queue and said, do you know what she said? And he said, very sort of casually, yeah, she called you an idiot. <laughs> And this, uh, that was pretty much my market experience too, actually. And so you just had to learn. 
to get past that. But I kind of loved it too because it was unvarnished and that you knew where you were and I was just going to have to get better at Ukrainian. I was also going to have to pick up some, some passive Russian as quickly as possible so I didn't have the idiot experience again. But, uh, but they're very direct, very direct. And, uh, and I, got, I got used to that. I frightened a person at a Tesco checkout a couple of weeks ago maybe, just for the same reason I've basically got to lose some of that and become a Brit again. <laughs> That's the thing I, I miss most about Ukraine. I think you're setting a brilliant example with your with <laughs> using Ukraine and in, 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 in Ukrainian in all. I'm not Russian. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to go to the back, and I can see there's a woman with dark hair with her hand up next to the man with the phone. You can be next. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Nigar, uh, CIS analyst working for the uh, consulting firm in London. So, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the conversation, and not just for interesting conversation, but also for heartfelt conversation that you had. I have to admit that I'm not a stranger to the Foreign Office. I worked at the British Embassy in Azerbaijan huh. for four years, and uh, during actually the time that you were working in Ukraine, and has heard about you a lot about the great job that you are doing there. I had a chance to meet the Martin Harris, who is now your uh, successor in Ukraine. He's there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so. Uh, uh, in short, so I would say thank you for also reminding me about my job and feeling a bit nostalgic, the things that you said about the CS CSF fund and etc. So my question uh, would be a bit uh, business related question. Um, I know that the embassies do a lot of work uh, on the program side, but also they do work closely, especially the trade teams with the companies. And um, so I, I, would, I would like to know if, uh, like, while you were in Ukraine, have you, like, Notice that uh, so reconstruction is obviously will be an important topic for Ukraine because it's it's getting a much uh, greater attention. Uh, so have you like noticed growing interest from the UK companies at the moment toward the reconstruction activities in Ukraine to ho to help the country uh, to rebuild its economy, uh, the country, uh, or you see that or you think that uh, based on your experience there is some pause they delay it. Uh, uh, because of the ongoing process, they are just in waiting mode. So I would be interested to know that. And also, in, in terms of the corruption that you mentioned, um, uh, yeah, we know that it was a big deal, and but there was lots of reforms going on, and I know that U UK specifically worked with the Ukraine a lot uh, to, to help them um, uh, to fight the corruption and bring democracy, etc. So is there certain plans, uh, are there any certain plans uh, nowadays um, at the embassy, for example, or uh, uh, by different UK agencies with the support of the British Embassy uh, to support this ongoing uh, anti-corruption efforts? Because as the reconstruction will be going on, so I think that should also be something that people need to keep in mind. And is there anything planned by the British Embassy or uh, in, in that field as well? So to help UK, uh, Ukraine to build back better. Thank you. Thank you. So the answer to the last one is yes. We were doing it before the war, we'll continue it. And, and again, actually, when I was in the interviews that I did in Ukraine, I would often be asked, when do you think when do you think the UK will have to stop working on corruption? And my answer was always that my predecessor had worked on it, I had worked on it, and I confidently expected that my successor would have to work on it. Not because, you know, there is so much corruption in Ukraine. Ukraine does have uh, uh, an issue in several levels of, of society and government and business with corruption, but actually more because when it's that entrenched, it takes a really long time to, to weed it out and change behaviours and create incentives. So it's the work of many years. So I firmly expect that Martin Harris will continue that work and frankly, so will his successor. It's an ongoing thing. But also don't forget that uh, the UK is, uh, that Ukraine is seeking um, candidacy status from the EU, well it has candidacy, but pre-accession in uh, December. December is the crunch point. And the EU uh, put seven criteria for reaching pre-accession, and one of those was tackling corruption. So there is a score sheet that Ukraine has to demonstrate to the EU. And indeed, the kind of support that the EU gives to Ukraine, it, it's, we're completely dwarfed by it. So the directions to look in, actually, are not so much what the EU and actually also the US gives a lot of support for tackling corruption alongside countries like the UK, but what they think, what the EU and what the US think, along with others, uh, about how that is going. Um, and that collective view is, you know, there are, there are as many concerns as there, are, uh, as there is positivity about progress. But I'm absolutely certain that that support will continue. 
In answer to your first one, well, we hosted the Ukraine Recovery Conference in June, and we created the Business Compact, and over 500 new businesses signed that compact, which indicated an intent to do business in Ukraine. It's now the job of Ukrainian ministers to turn those 500 companies' intent into contracts, and they are acutely aware of that. So that's the Vice Prime Minister for the Economy, Yulia Sviridenko, and the Vice Prime Minister for Reconstruction, Sasha Kubrakov. So they have both been shuttling back and forth with their various plans, getting companies signed up. But um, corruption isn't the only issue that Ukraine has. They also have an issue with ease of doing business. And the uh, technocratic stumbling blocks in terms of registering companies, et cetera, et cetera. This is Kubrakov's job to sort, and I'm sure that he will, but it takes time. But here's the thing. Ukraine is a huge country, and in the west of the country, a lot of businesses are moving in to Lviv region specifically. And at first it was humanitarian agencies and it was um, prosthetic companies because most people who were losing limbs were being sent to Lviv uh, for um, prosthetics. And there are uh, several hospitals now that specialize in it, several countries that are helping. By the way, the UK is also helping now, both in terms of um, specialist medical technical assistance, but also we're helping give the kit, which is a fantastic thing. But what I noticed when I went to Lviv two weeks before I left was the number of Western companies that were setting up there, including consultancies. So you have two things going on there. One is that the West of the country is now providing a bit of economic impetus. It's not enough to sustain Ukraine, but you can no longer say that the whole of the country is, uh, is all about the fight. Some of the country is about the rebuilding and that's happening in the West of the country. And uh, if anyone is interested in being part of reconstruction, actually getting to know what is happening that's making it possible for businesses to establish there is a really important thing to do. But the other message that tells you is that no one's waiting for the end of the fight. Indeed, we know that Ukrainians aren't waiting for the end of the fight. They are already rebuilding. And in the same way as they fight, if they didn't get the money, they'd, they'd build with what they have. And it would take so much longer, but they would do it. So uh, the opportunities are there now, just as the challenges are. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more brief question, because we've only got two minutes left. And oh, um, I'm really sorry, but I'm not going to, no way I can get to all these questions. Okay. Uh, the lady right in the front, in the middle there. Like, yeah. I'm sorry, everybody else. Uh, good evening, and thank you for sharing your uh, insights with us. I represent a British international school in Ukraine, so and we have so much in common with you. The UK embassy did never leave the country as my school. We never leave the country as well. So I'm proud to say that we are the only international school in Ukraine uh, that started operating, physical operating, since uh, the, uh, September last year. We finished uh, our academic year successfully with the global support and uh, you know, with the assistance, ongoing assistance. And when you chose to stay in Ukraine, you sent a very powerful message not only to Ukrainians, across the world also. And uh, this year, we also opened, physically opened uh, in Kiev in Dnipro mm -hmm. on the 1st of September. And we still have some international teachers, including our principal, David Cole. Uh, who, you know, chose to stay with us physically. And I do remember that uh, a month prior to the invasion, uh, to notwithstanding that all our international teachers started receiving warnings and heads up from their embassies, they just all, uh, almost all of them uh, didn't leave the country. And I do remember this morning of the 24th February pretty well. So, and the morning that changed our lives forever. How would you describe this morning for you? And what is the... Uh, generally, what is the uh, impact of your ambassadorship in Ukraine during these challenging times? Uh, also, I would like to add that education, so we are committed to delivering education to our children because it's part of our nationwide resilience against the aggressor. So uh, our British school that was made in Ukraine, seasoned in Ukraine, and uh, you know, just our British traditional values are now hugely enhanced with the Ukrainian indomitable spirit. Thank you. Thank you. So I find it not that easy to talk about the 24th of February, actually, because it was um, such a difficult night. So uh, I left Kiev on the Saturday, the Friday night, actually, before the invasion. So I'd only been in Lviv for four days when uh, we reached that night. And the thing was, what you have to remember is that UK was one of two countries who was seeing this coming. So the UK and the US were engaged for a good six months before then 
talking to other countries about what we were seeing. I was fronting that from uh, Ukraine, inside Ukraine. I'd briefed EU ambassadors. I'd been in and out of the palace of the president. I was telling everyone I could find in the way I best could what I could see happening. So by the time I got to Lviv, I was exhausted because, of course, we were, you know, you could see, you could see the physical movement, as it were, and a lot of public debate about culmination. So the point at which stuff was ready, and if it didn't go now, then it was going to have to withdraw, and therefore it was going to go. So I didn't sleep um, any night before that happened. I didn't sleep on Saturday. Well, I arrived at 3 a.m. on Saturday, so no sleep then. Saturday night, Sunday night, Monday night, I was awake looking at the sky, so I was exhausted. But on the night of the invasion, I was, you know, I probably sort of napped for an hour or two, and then I woke up and went and looked out of the window and remember hearing an air raid siren for the first time ever. Of course, since then, I've heard it several hundred times. But I'd never heard an air raid siren before, except in war movies and what my father had told me. And so my first uh, thought was that I never thought in my lifetime that I would hear that sound as a live thing, as an indicator of something happening. And I also thought, and this is not meant to be funny, it will sound funny, but it's not meant to be. I, my other thought was that the technology for air raid sirens had not evolved at all, <laughs> which is a really odd and, you know, thought to have. But the thing was, it sounded exactly like the sirens that you heard in, in movies about the Second World War. It was exactly the same. That's what it sounded like. And then minutes after I heard that siren, and it was freezing cold that night too and quite misty, I heard uh, airplanes flying low. And I knew that the skies had been closed. So obviously those were fighter planes, but I didn't know whether they were Ukrainian or Russian. And that was frightening. Um, and was the beginning, actually, of a, 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 a period where rumours came thick and fast, you know, about where those tanks were heading, whether they would go to Kiev or whether they would head towards Lviv region, which is where we were, and uh, rumours of collaborators and rumours of Wagner Group who were coming looking for diplomats. I really can't tell you how difficult that, that period was. But the worst, I think, thing about it was that that was the period when no one thought it possible that Ukraine could win it. You could see that line of tanks from space. So that was why, that's why I find it hard to talk about that night, because what I and my colleagues who were with me in Lviv, who since spoken about it, was that the biggest thing that characterized our reaction that night wasn't so much fear as total hopelessness. And it's the only time I felt that way, through not knowing what was going to come. It was a really hard time. And I don't really like, since I know this is the last question, I don't want to end it on that thought I therefore also remember seeing those tanks calcify, you know, as they kind of got trapped and stuck and they didn't move. Um, and I was by then um, brought out to Poland. But we were camping on the border. We were literally hopping from one foot to another. We were not going back to London. We had a humanitarian operation going on there. I was commuting to Warsaw and back so that I could use their communications at our embassy. And I shot to Warsaw to uh, tell them that I was going home for my short break to see my family, but that when I came back, I thought I needed to go to Kiev. And was utterly delighted to get a, yes, we think you should do that. And they made it possible. And the rest, as they say, history. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very Ukrainian.